What I want to do today is to talk about how actually events can be not only coordinated in time, but coordinated also in space. And this will have a lot of overlap with some concepts that you have already heard from both Andy's lecture yesterday and some things that even James mentioned today. And uh, before we get into the specifics, let me just try to make the claims that actually waves could be a much broader phenomenon in biology that we often realize. We've seen a similar movie. This is not as nice as the one that Andy was showing yesterday, maybe with the two colors. But you, what you can see here, and this is taken from this paper, are, way, are during somatogenesis of one of the cyclic genes that oscillates, as Andy was discussing yesterday. But and you can see that when you really look at it, there are there's clearly waves of activity that are traveling both in space and time. And this is not only specific to somatogenesis. There are many phenomena in biology that show this wave-like behavior. There is uh, firefly synchronization, in which you can really see this, like, that if you have a lot of fireflies in the wild, then they can just synchronize with each other, and they can generate this wave-like pattern. And the embryonic development is really also shows a lot of this example. Here is one in which you can have uh, upon fertilization of a Xenopus egg, and you see that, the, that there is a calcium wave that I, I think I should have looked at it when I started. It's relatively fast, and you can see where the sperm enter is going to be a calcium wave and actually a wave of contraction. So, so what is the role of this wave? And one possibility is maybe that those waves are a way to coordinate biological events over large scales. So if you want to transfer information over tissue that are large, that are not of order of few micron diffusion, is really not going to help you much. So maybe you need some specialized mechanism. And we have already seen in Carl Philippe lecture, and this is a movie from Jim Ferrell lab, in which when vertebrate embryo, this is a xenopus egg, divide, undergo cleavage division, you get, really get this very clear contraction of the cortex that are associated with cell division. And recently, at least more theoretically, in a pa there was a paper from um, um, Ruben Perez Carrasco, and James is one of the other in this, in which they, they were addressing the problem of if you have a dynamical morphogen gradient, and you've heard about this a lot in this course, that is talking toward the, the, one of the simplest circuits that you could think could generate bistability, is the so-called toggle switch, which is just if you have a double inhibition, A represses B and B represses A, you can generate essentially two stable states, one in which A is high and B is low, and alternative another state in which B is high and A is low. And if this is coupled to a morphogen that is, uh, was dynamic, is changing, you can actually generate wave of differentiation across the tissue. And this paper also shows that the speed of the traveling wave that one gets is a function of noise, and is something I will get back to. But there's nothing special about biology and about the fact that you can see waves. You can see waves also if you just have simple chemical reaction. And one of the standard examples is um, the bellus of zapotisky reaction, in which if you mix uh, malonic acid with any bromide atoms, you get this really beautiful wave propagating. This was actually had a big impact on chemistry because people sort of assume that in chemistry, since everything has to go to steady state, it will go to steady state in the most boring exponential function. Instead, you can really get the very beautiful dynamics. Th those are, it's all transient. If I let this movie go, you'll see that this uh, Petri dish will eventually homogenize and will all become white. But yet, it displays a lot of very interesting dynamics. And you don't even need chemistry. You can just have waves in physics. And this is what happens if you put the water in your freezer and you let it cool for about two, three hours. So this water is super cold. It's below zero temperature, but it's still water because there hasn't been any ice crystal forming yet. But then if you perturb it, for example, by banging on it, then if ice forms and it forms in a wave. You can actually do an even cooler experiment. Instead of banging on it, you can just tie, add a very small ice crystal and you will see that it will also nucleate and initiate a wave. Sorry for the shaking. I, didn't, I all got these movies from YouTube. So, and, and again, you can see that there is a traveling wave. 
So can we understand where this wave come from? And uh, of course, embryonic development also shows them. And uh, I've shown you this movie already. But what I will talk, be talking to you about today mainly in a little bit is the work that we do in our own lab, in my own lab. And this is for you. So now there, are, there will be chemical waves that synchronize the early mitosis of Drosophila. And what you can see here is that you have waves that start at the poles and propagate. And what is also interesting about the fly embryo, and we'll get back to that, is that it's actually, as development progresses, this wave gets lower. And that will be one of the main focus of my talk, is to show you and convince you, hopefully, that we understand why this wave gets lower and how they are coordinated. And so there will be one last wave where you actually will be able to see very clearly the slowdown. And now you see this, this very slow propagation of the wave. OK. And this will be the last 13 division. We talked about last time how they count to 13. Why do they divide 13 times? We still don't know how that happens, but this will be the 13 division. So in trying to understand how wave propagates, usually a very good place to start is the so-called fischer kolmogorov petrovsky piskunov equation. It was first proposed by Fischer, the same Fischer of genetics and statistics, in 1937. What he was interested in was uh, what happens if you have a logistic equation? This is just an equation in which, if you did not have this term, it will just explain exponential growth. But if you're thinking of an, uh, an organism growing in the wild or even an allele in a population, you could think that there is a capacity. There might be a limited amount of food or something that is limiting so that the this organism, when there's very few of them, will start by growing exponentially, but then eventually this will need to reach saturation when you get to that capacity. And this is the simplest equation that describes it. And, and what Fisher uh, was interested in was what happens if I couple this simple, or one of the simplest law of growth with, um, with, the, with diffusion. So I put it a special term. And uh, he was interested in the spreading of allele through population. And he could show that this generates a wave. And, uh, and then the Russian mathematician actually gave a, a much more careful treatment of this, showing what was happening. So what is the behavior of a logistic equation? Let's just start by thinking of a logistic equation in the absence of diffusion. And the way one goes about understanding this, and this is probably very obvious for the physicist, but I just want to remind it, and that's why I drew this plot. So one could, in this case, one could just solve this equation, but we instead are going to do something a little more intuitive and based on geometry. What well, one does, one usually just plots the derivative, and the con in this case, the derivative of the concentration and the concentration. And then the points that are very important in looking at the dynamics are the point where the derivative is 0. That those are the points where eventually you'll get and the system is not going to change. However, there is two classes of points if you do it in one dimension, where it's very easy. Things get more complicated in multiple dimensions. So the point could either be unstable or be stable. So this point is unstable. What that means is that if you're sitting right at zero, you'll be there. But as soon as you perturb the system a little bit, if you have a little bit more C, then the derivative is positive and you'll just be pushed towards this state. On the other hand, if you're sitting on this state and you go a little bit to the left, you're pushed back here. If you go to the right, you're pushed back. This is a stable state. So based on this, what you will expect is that if you start simulating this equation, you'll essentially end up with C equal 1 at some point. So in the system, will this, this is what you will do. But so what happens if you add space to this? So what happens if now? What I'm doing here is simulating that equation. And I'm just starting with the initial conditions that are not uniform. If I were to start with 0 everywhere, this will not go anywhere. What I'm doing is right in the middle, I have a little bump. So there's a little bit of C that is describing my population of alleles, if we want to go with Fisher. And then, then I'm just going to simulate it and see what it does. C grows up and go to 1, and then you get this nice wave spreading. Why is that a wave? Well, what one usually do is one makes the ansatz that there will be a wave, and then one tries to see what are the conditions in which this wave could exist. This is a slightly more complicated exercise than it may sound. I'm just going to give you 
some insight though in the math since we are in a, at the end of the day we are in a theoretical physics place it's okay to actually go through the math I think and I find I think that some of you may find it interesting so we, what we are going to do uh, what one usually does is one instead of saying that the concentration depend on x and t one makes the assumption that there is a wave that means that the concentration is actually a function of x minus vt this means that if you know what the profile is at a given space and time, then all you have to do is evolve it because it's just going to be a wave traveling. So as long as you, you don't need to know both x and t, it's just the, you need to know x and the speed of the wave, and then you can, you can describe the behavior. And uh, of course, we can start with the previous equation and drop all the parameter d and alpha by redefining space and time. This is called making an equation non-dimensional. So what now we do, instead of taking this equation, we, we can call this variable z, and we can rewrite this as a function of z, and the, here the one prime will mean first derivative and the two prime second derivative. So now instead of having a partial differential equation, we get an ordinary differential equation that has this form. Right, so you can very easily normalize it and you can rescale d and alpha. This is just, in one case, is a, you can renormalize the concentration, redefine space, redefine time, so that essentially this is very general. Then if you want to get to your specific case, you just have to redefine your variable based on what alpha and d. And your, this could have been ct, but then you can just divide everywhere by ct and it's just a, right, a normalized concentration. Okay, so now we are left with this equation, and the way that we want to solve is with the boundary condition in which, I, so here there is one thing we need to be careful, is that actually time, in, in this definition that I gave, time is running backward, right? So, because there's a minus sign, so instead of having something that starts from zero and goes to one, we are gonna actually have something that starts from one and goes to zero, which means that we need to solve, one needs to solve this equation with the boundary condition that at time minus infinity, the solution is one, and at time infinity now is zero. And the way that one does it, if you have two-dimensional equation, is that, I mean, a second-order differential equation is that you can map it into two equations by defining another variable u, which is the derivative of c, and then you can rewrite u prime. And now what one needs to do again is to find the, the fixed point and, and, and this is really easy because a solution of u, u just, it's a, a solution with u equals zero and c either zero or one will, uh, will solve this equation. And, uh, and what we are looking for are a, is a solution in which now the origin is a, a stable fixed point because what we want is a, because our system is traveling back in time is that it's gonna end up here and, and, and that point is stable. So the way that one does this, again, most of you, the physicists will know this, but the way that one does this, if you have this two um, ordinary differential equation, is that you find the steady state and you do a, pertur a small perturbation around the steady state, very similar to what I was explaining. It's like taking your system and just moving it a little bit and seeing how it responds. That response is just given by essentially taking the derivative of this function and computing them at steady state. What that means is that essentially these are not functions, these are just numbers. So essentially we have mapped a problem into a problem of uh, ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients in which there is just a matrix A and then one could just use geometry and it's very simple if you know things like the determinant of this matrix or its trace or the trace of the matrix, you can really easily see if there, if there are unstable nodes, spirals, and what we want is a stable node. What that means is a point where the system is just gonna go there and stuck because sometimes it's possible that a system will evolve into something by spiraling, and that will give us some, some non-physical solution. So when we put, but one can actually, in this case, the equations are so simple that one can actually just compute the, what the eigenvalues are and so what the eigenvalue means is that if you add that system I just showed you will mean that the per a perturbation in C and a perturbation in U 
will evolve will evolve with uh, will evolve accordingly uh, or this could be i mean this one will need to to compute the also the the again vector but the, essentially the perturbation in in u and c with some or some linear combination of them will evolve in time according to the to the eigenvalue, and, but because we want this fluctuation to go to zero, all we are looking for are cases in which both these lambda are negative. And the only way to get that for zero is essentially that the velocity is larger than two. So every speed that is larger than two is a possible solution of Fisher equation. And then one could do actually a lot more complicated math that I don't really want to get into. But to, uh, actually to show that the really stable solution is only one with a speed of V equal to. So, and we'll get actually, this is not as simple as it sounds, but we'll get, we'll get back to it in a second. So if one were to do a phase diagram of plotting, this is from a book where what I call C is called uh, U, and so, so this could be C and C prime. What you see, there are solution or in this phase diagram, you get solution in which you start from here and end up there, and that is what we are looking for because our system is running backward in time. And in terms of profile, you will get something similar to what I showed in the simulation. You get a profile, and, and this profile is traveling, will be traveling over time. So a simple logistic equation with diffusion could generate waves. The speed of the waves will be Q times the diffusion coefficient times alpha, where alpha is the parameter that was in front of the logistic equation. And from, uh, from the point of view of what this means for the physics or the geometry, what you have is you have something that is starting from an unstable state and is traveling into a stable state. However, this is not the system what we are often interested in in biology and James, and what James and I have touched in our previous lecture about these is the fact that often systems in biology are, are bistable. So would a bistable system with diffusion also generate waves? And so what we want to consider is a state, if you want, in which a stable state invi invades a metastable state. So one could just write a generic reaction diffusion equation for the physicist at Ginsburg-Landau equation. And then one wants to simulate this with a potential that has this shape. This is pretty much what will describe the physics example I was showing you before. You have super cool water, so you could think that this is your, the state where you have ice, and this is the stable state, but you are trapped in this state because you haven't got a fluctuation yet that has brought you over the barrier. But as soon as the fluctuation appears or introduces a perturbation, the system is going to evolve from water into ice or from this low state to the ice state. But what are the characteristics of this system? Does it really have a wave? And what are the property of the wave? So we repeat the same trick. We say there must be a wave, and we rewrite our equation. And now we end up with something like this. And now instead of analyzing this in two, you're using the same 2D trick, I'm going to explain you another way to do this, which I think gives a very intuitive in interpretation of uh, what are the prop physical property of a chemical wave that spread through a bistable potential. If you, for a second, assume that this derivative of time derivative, and this was uh, describing a position, the second derivative will be an acceleration, and this will be a speed. So what you can think of is that this is very similar to just Newtonian mechanics in which you have a particle of mass d that is moving in a force field minus rc with a friction coefficient, right? Because if you have minus v times c prime, and this is, you can think of this as speed, so you will have that um, v will be a friction. So what you really need to solve in this case, and the way to think about this, is that you have the potential that I gave you before, and now you flip that potential because you have a minus sign in, in front of the force. And to find the speed of the wave, you could think that in this potential, you roll down a ball from this, and the ball goes down and has to come up and stop here. However, there is multiple solutions that will do that because one possibility is that the ball just rolled down and the friction coefficient is so that it stops here. 
and that friction coefficient will be the speed we are looking for. But there could be another solution in which the ball rolls down, goes over, comes here, then comes back and stops on its way back. That's another solution. And then there could be another solution in which this rolls, goes here, comes back here, and goes back there, and there would be another solution. So there's really an infinity of solution, and one could show with a little bit more advanced math, we're actually going to take a couple of minutes to go over, that this is the stable solution. And the, but this, the reason why I want to show you this is that it gives you an intuitive interpretation of where the speed of a wave is coming from, and we'll get back to this when we actually talk about why the speed of the wave in the embryo were slowing down. So the, the, this is an important concept for us, and that's why I'm taking some trouble of going through the math. So this may be a little more technical for the non-physicist, but what one does, one repeats the linear stability analysis for the differential equation with space and time, and one end up with this sort of equation. And then you make, since this equation is linear in time, you can just rewrite it as a, something that only depends exponentially on time, times something that is a function of uh, the space coordinate. And then essentially, if you do these answers, you end up with a Schrodinger equation. And um, as you do that, then you can just plot this energy potential. And when you do that, what you'll realize is that everything that has a positive energy will quickly decay. And as such, all the solutions that have a positive energy will, be, will essentially be unstable. And so if you think there will be few solutions of uh, speed of low energy, and then all the speed of all the solution that have a high energy uh, will be high. Sp uh, in this case, will be a low speed. They are all unstable. And then one could go through a bit more trouble and actually show that um, that this early solution. So the solution in which, in this potential, the ball is just rolling down and stopping right here. Th this is the stable solution. So the, the highest possible friction coefficient or the highest possible speed will be what, um, what will control the speed of the wave. And this gives us a nice geometrical interpretation of what is happening because if you have a, if you had a bistable system in which now here instead of plotting the potential, this will be the derivative of the force, what you, what you see is that depending, if you jump when the barrier is very, very high, then you're going to get a very low speed. But as, the, as this barrier becomes lower and lower, and this, which means that this energy barrier goes down, essentially then you need a much higher friction to have the ball to stop. That would mean that the speed is high. So by simply thinking about how, how much in the unstable region you need to be to jump to the stable region, you can get an intuition of why you get a wave to slow down. Yeah. Yeah, we, right, and we think that, so the waves that we have, that I showed you, they essentially propagate along the anterior, posterior axis. They are on a two-dimensional manifold, but if you think about the effect of curvature, given what, diffu the, given the, the diffusion coefficient and the speed of the wave, you can ignore curvature. So it's essentially a one-dimensional wave, so we don't have to worry about this effect. Right, so what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that if you have a, if you have a one-dimensional system and you can write the reaction term as a potential term, the geometrical property of that potential are going to tell you what the speed is. There's going to be only one speed that is possible in such a system that is stable. And you can, in principle, derive that by doing the simple exercise of solving Newtonian dynamics or what is the friction coefficient that's going to make a ball roll down and stops right here. But there would be one speed that's going to be a property of the geometry of the potential. That's, I guess, the take-home message. Right, so, so, so it's, uh, right, I mean, 
what determines the speed is really going to be the whole shape of the potential. So, so it's, not, it's not as trivial. There are some limits in which you can sort of convince yourself that maybe it's just proportional to this difference in, in energy. But for the more general case, it's going to be a function of the detail of the system. Which, right, but that will not be a solution, right? So, so, so remember, we, we have a system that goes, so what the, so you have something that starts from here and jumps to there, right? This is the physical condition, is your water becoming ice. Once you do all this trick, what you do is that you flip the potential because you had a minus sign in the equation, but you also have time running backwards. So what you're looking is for a solution of a ball that goes down here and comes back and stops right here. That's that, the, the friction coefficient that gives you that, one can show you using this, this you know, Schrodinger, mapping this into a quantum mechanic example. One can show that that's the only stable solution. So that's just the wave you're going to get. I mean, that's just math. So there's only one wave that is possible. It's going to be stable and it's going to be geometrically, you can compute it by doing this little Newtonian mechanic exercise. So, so the, the take home message here is that essentially if you have a, a bistable system that generates a wave and you, the best way to think about how the speed of the wave or the physical property of the wave are controlled is to map these into a a problem in which you have a potential and thinking about the geometrical properties of that potential. Actually, the speed of this wave is relative, will be relatively insensitive to noise, although I'm going to show you how there is some, if you make the potential dependent on time, then you get noise sensitivity, which, is a, which will be our case for the waves in the, in the embryo. And finally, if you read a lot of biological literature where people talk about the wave, they use the equation I showed you before, the Fisher equation, and they tell you that the speed of the wave you get is 2 times the diffusion coefficient times alpha, where this alpha then they will say is the time scale of the positive feedback that control your biological system. That's wrong. So if you really want to compute the speed of a wave in a bistable system, you need to do a bit more work. What? Why would you? Uh, you so, so the, I'm describing waves that are, uh, so this is not an excitable system. This is just a bistable system plus diffusion that generates a wave. And I'll show you that this is what's relevant for the control of mitosis because really it's the, the entry into mitosis, which is a bistable switch that is controlling the wave. And um, you'll see that what closes the oscillation is just, it has nothing to do with the wave, but I'll show you at the end. Okay, so now let's go back to the embryo and um, let's look at what they do again. And uh, so, so now we have waves and um, again you can see that these are essentially one-dimensional waves. They only propagate along the anterior-posterior axis. There is very little effect of curvature. They're clearly well-organized waves that help to synchronize the cell division in the embryo. And this is the main biological function is that you want to divide as fast as you can, but also in a manner that is synchronous through the, through the entire tissue. And while this is a syncytium, it will be too big for diffusion to work. If you plug a reasonable number for the diffusion of protein and you compute how long it will take a molecule to start from here and diffuse to the middle, it will take like two hours and development is over in about that time scale. So you need a specialized mechanism and it's this collective mechanism. So we are not the first one, we are not the first one to think about this trigger wave. They were first proposed by Tyson and Novak in a theoretical paper, and then some evidence for it came in a synthetic system, in actually a Xenopus egg extract, in a work from Jim Ferrella. And uh, they had the idea that um, they, if you have a bistable system coupled to diffusion, it could generate some waves, chemical waves, and then they show that if you look at mitosis, in the, in, in, they have an extract. So essentially what you do, you take an embryo, you crush it, 
and you spin down the cytoplasm, you pick up the cytoplasm, and you put in a Teflon tube, and you can reconstitute some nuclei, and that will undergo mitosis, several mitosis, and they could show that if you look at the progression of this mitosis, they progress in a similar wave-like pattern, and they show that you could perturb this wave-like pattern by perturbing CDK1, and they interpret that as meaning that there were waves of CDK1. I'll show you that what we did was actually directly visualizing those waves, which I think is better. And, but uh, this mechanism was brought into question by Andrea Leo's group at UPenn because what she noticed was exactly the, the same thing that I was uh, drawing your attention when you were looking at this, and it's the fact that the mitotic wave gets lower. And what they also, and this is shown here, if you, have, you look at the speed of the wave as a function of cell cycle, there is a clear decay in the speed. But what they also noticed was that the distance between one nucleus to the next, as you get more and more nuclei, is also getting slower. It's getting smaller, sorry. And so they thought maybe there is actually, they are not talking through chemistry, they are talking mechanically, so that if there is a fixed amount of time to propagate a mechanical signal from one nucleus to the next, then from one nucleus to the next, as you get more and more nuclei, or you reduce their, their distance, then what you, will, what you should have is that it takes longer. And I'm, I'll argue that this mechanism, and this idea that it's mechanical is actually wrong. So, so the first thing we wanted to show, and this is, I think, the first thing you should show is that these, they are really, this is really an active mechanism in which the nuclei are talking to each other. Another possibility is that Every nucleus in the embryo was just at its own clock, but they just had very, very accurate clock, and everybody just knew exactly when it needed to divide. You could still have a wave if there was a gradient in the timing on how this clock ticked, because if I knew that I had to divide at 12, and you knew that you had to divide at 12.05, then you could still make an apparent wave. One way to think about this is actually, and you know, it's our favorite example in the lab, is the Mexican wave at the stadium. So there are two ways. One way in which you could have a wave going around the soccer stadium. One is that everybody gets up when the next guy gets up. And that way, if you imagine that now you can see where your next guy is because I put a barrier, then what will happen is that you don't know when to get up. But another possibility is that I tell everybody in the stadium at what time exactly they need to get up. And if I do that in a gradient, everybody will get up at the right time. And so the prediction there is that if I put a barrier, when they're talking to each other, the wave will start going, but then it will stop. The next guy on this side of the barrier cannot see that this guy has got up, so he doesn't know when he needs to get up. But if they, are on the, they have their own clock, then everybody's getting up on time. So if I put a barrier in the embryo, then the wave should go right through. So if there was just a timing mechanism, or what is called a kinematic mechanism, or a phase wave, it will travel right through the barrier. A trigger wave will be absorbed by the barrier. So we have um, Andy and James have talked about mechanism to think about if cells are talking to each other by either taking them out or by genetically manipulating. We do something a little cruder because our time scale are really fast. They're not transcribing. So we just go in with a razor blade and ligate the embryo. It works. It's impressive that it works, but it does. And, uh, and this is what you see if you do that experiment. Actually, if Victoria, sitting right there, did this, this experiment, I don't think I could do them. I'm not as skilled of an experimentalist as she is. And you see that one half of the embryo divides, and then the other half divides. And actually, if, you, if I let this movie go, you'll see that this half does an extra division, and this one doesn't. So they are clearly talking to each other. If you put a barrier in the embryo, you can totally desynchronize it. So now this wave will start. And this is something you will never see, a wave that will stop right at the, at the barrier like this, unless there is a barrier there. So they are clearly talking to each other. It's a nothing mechanism. Well, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a theoretical possibility. So I would agree it's an unlikely one, but we need to prove. I'll show you that you can use this trick, though, to, to time exactly when the synchronization is happening in the cell cycle. So I'll show you that, actually, if you do inside this, ex, this same experiment in certain phase of the cell cycle, the wave will go right through the barrier. 
So th this will actually be the punchline of the talk. You also. So, so I think if I understand you correctly, you are asking why does it start at the pole? Why, 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 the, why do you get a wave starting here and a wave starting there and they don't start randomly? The short answer is we don't know. So we observe that we know there is waves, they are actively coupled. There is a strong preference to start at the pole. It's not an absolute fact, but probably 90% of the wave we look, they tend to start at the poles. We don't really understand why. I don't think there is a signal. Then. This is way earlier before all this gradient act. And uh, definitely there is deviation. So my favorite interpretation is just something geometric. So the embryo is maybe more pointed at the end, and maybe just there is a slightly higher concentration of the enzymes that regulate the cell cycle, or maybe there is a little fewer nuclei at the tip. And I showed you last time that the ratio between DNA content and cytoplasmic content can influence the cell cycle. But we don't know. We haven't done an experiment. It's very difficult to do an experiment that conclusively show why the poles are special. But, but the, the wave is real. James? How, how often does this probe work? You know, the sequencing failures where you have partial ligation. So if you only partially ligated. Right. Right, so so I guess what you're asking is how, how, how well ligated do they need to be to be separated? Do you, have you looked at that? I mean, um, I mean what I can tell you is that you, you have to go like, for example, the way, completely like, right on this side, um, and then you have to go the way So by is about, so how far do you need to, usually you go up, uh, down to almost 10, 15 micron to the other side, the best estimate. So, so we, you really have to go really deep because this is about, if you look at the height of an embryo, it's probably about 150 microns. So you have to really push it down all the way to about like only having a 10 to 15 micron constriction, at which point I think you're applying so much pressure that it's very difficult for things or very slow for things to diffuse through. Sure. Yeah, the thing is, I mean, it's not so easy to ligate in different geometry. I mean, it's like this is a small object, they're really delicate. I mean, yeah, it would be great if you could go in and just block it in a circle and see how they travel around or generate this cut or do it in two places and see if the waves start interfering is uh, yeah 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 no i don't i don't think we have to i mean this is like very simplistic at this point but okay so sure so okay so th this is an important point they, everybody's trying to oscillate. So the cell cycle is going on in every nucleus independently. The role of the wave is just to make sure that if you are a little delayed compared to your next guy, it just gives you a little kick so that you go on time. So it's a synchronization mechanism, but everybody's trying to go through the cell cycle. So this is not like an axon, right, an action potential traveling down an axon where you start, right, the excitation in the neuron and then you just, you, there is a signal propagating, and if you cut, there will be nothing going through. If you, I mean, technically it's essentially impossible. You will need two razor, razor blade with, within like, this is all the alpha millimeter long, and you will need to put two razor blades so close to each other and really control them accurately. It will be very difficult. But um, if one could do that experiment, this nuclei will still divide. I think they will just, you will have three, three different area out of sync. But the, this is an important part, though. Everybody's trying to go through the cell cycle. Everybody's making CDK1 activity and destroying it. This is just making sure that they stay in schedule. And what this experiment show you is that if you, don't, if you don't let them talk to each other, they can fall significantly out of schedule. And that will, like, we think, influence gastrulation and a lot of other processes because the fly embryo develops so quickly that you really want to get to the point where you make your genes all together. 
so that everybody then synchronously start these morphogenetic processes. So that's the interpretation. You have the question. Those droplets, they make that see what they, they can make those droplets. They're really small. So I don't think that they've looked as spatial. Uh, but the, the droplets are, I think, of such a size. So what he's talking about are experiments in which people go in with a needle, suck out the nuclei, and put them in a droplet on a cover slip. But those droplets are probably about 30 or 40 micron in size. And diffusion is even enough. You don't need. So the, the problem with diffusion is that it goes like the square root of time. So it's very easy to diffuse small distance, but when you want to diffuse large distance, it becomes very difficult. That's why you need a specialized mechanism. OK, so well, what did we do? And I think this was uh, our major contribution to this, was to actually find a way to, to look at CDK1 activity, which as Jim Ferrell had proposed. And if you work on cell cycle and you remember Monday lecture, this is the master regulator of the cell cycle. So why don't we look if there are waves in CDK1 activity? But what we wanted to do was not to just look at mitosis as a proxy of activity. We wanted to measure the chemical activity. And we were very lucky because John Pines and Cambridge had made this great sensor, which worked very beautifully for us in the embryo. And this is a FRET sensor. I explained it last time already. But the idea is simply that a CDK1 is a kinase. What the kinase does, it puts phosphates on a peptide. If when it puts a phosphate on this peptide, this peptide changes conformation. These two molecules get closer. As they get closer, it is possible that a dipole moment excitation from this molecule is transferred to that molecule. So as you excited this molecule with blue light, you don't get blue fluorescence out, but the energy goes to this, and you get yellow fluorescence instead of blue fluorescence when they are far apart. This is great. It's a great molecular ruler because the typical distance for this thing need to be about a few nanometers close to each other. So if you design this well, it's very likely that they will only fret when they are in this conformation. Making fret sensor though is much harder than I made it sound. Actually, they very rarely work, but it worked beautifully from, for us, thankfully. And um, we get this really beautiful oscillation as a function of the cell cycle. And if you mutate the serine where that is phosphorylated, as you would expect, you get no activity. The same is true if you knock down CDK1. I'm not showing you all the controls that we did, but it works. And so what we can do is really not only measure this activity very accurate in time, we can also do it uh, relatively accurate in space, definitely accurate enough to see the waves. So what we norm the way that we normally plot it, we plot the activity with time on the x-axis and uh, um, spatial coordinate on the y-axis. And then the way we go about looking if there are waves, or we meaning Victoria does, is uh, she takes an embryo and computationally divides it into several slides. And we can do this because the waves mainly seem to, trans to travel along the anterior-posterior axis, so we can map this into a one-dimensional problem in space, and she looks at the activity in one region where the wave starts, and then you look at the activity in another region down. And what you get is what you would expect if there was a wave. You get one profile in one region and about the same profile, but shifted over time. So this is a wave that is traveling from here to there, and, that, and this is what you're seeing. And then we do simple computational tricks in which we do cross-correlation, and we found how much was this lies, the activity here delayed with respect to the activity there. We find the mass maximum of these, and then we plot this delay that we estimate as a function of the distance. And you get more or less linear profile, at least in a first good approximation, which are indicative of um, that these waves travel more or less at constant speed. And uh, it's because we have time versus distance, the inverse of this slope will actually give you speed. So high slope means low speed, low slope, uh, high speed. And you can do this in an embryo for various cell cycle. And this is just a, another way to show you again that the wave gets lower. So cycle 10 and 11, you have very slow slope, fast waves. And then a cycle 12, the wave is a little slower. And cycle 13 is significantly slower. You do this for like 50 cell cycles, various cell cycles, various embryo, and you end up with plot like this. 
So you now have uh, the speed of the wave at cycle 10 and 11 is high, and then cycle 12 and 13 is significantly lower. Yeah. If you have what? Which mutant? Oh, if you block CDK1, it doesn't divide. Yeah, it gets stuck. I mean, it's absolutely required for division. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you in a second. I haven't told you yet what this is. It's uh, actually theoretical prediction is even a big word. But what, 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 we, what we did was not only so far, I just told you about CDK1 activity. But if, you, if CDK1 activity really was the, and the wave was what would drove mitosis, what you would expect is that as you see CDK1 wave traveling, you also see mitosis traveling, right? So what we, what we do in our experiment, we not only measure CDK1, we have a third fluorescent protein on which we visualize histones. And we look at how histones change shape, because that's a proxy of mitosis and when the nuclei split, and the, pre the theoretical prediction is that these two waves should have the same speed, right? If really a CDK1 wave drove a mitotic wave, so I don't know that you can call it theoretical, it's just a prediction, is that if this wave is driving that wave, they should be in a one-to-one -one relationship. And this is exactly, so this would be the identity line, and this is the best fit line. So you can see that it's true. These two waves travel at the same speed. Yeah? The, the color, the different color are different cell cycles. So you can do this at cycle 10, 11, 12, and 13. So what you see is at cycle 13, all the points are down here. So both the CDK1 wave and the mitotic wave are very slow. And then at cycle 12, they're a little faster. And then cycle 10 and 11, they're much faster. And you can see also this, this noise, and we'll get back to that. Here? Oh, what these colors are, so that's the mean. That's the standard deviation, and that's some part. I, I don't remember. You can ask Victoria later. She made the plot. Yes, I will get there. It's, uh, I need to bother you with a bit more molecules before I get there, unfortunately. But I promise I'll, I'll try to answer that, and we can talk more later if you're not satisfied. Yeah. Right. I don't know, you measure a speed getting number of molecules. Right, right. So if you were to measure how many units that you need to talk from the Oh, right. So I'll show you, I'll, I'll, I'll show some experiment that really argue against the mechanical signal. And then if you're not satisfied, we can talk again, okay? So what I'll show you is that you can perturb CDK1 activity and I can exactly predict what the speed of the wave will be, and that's what the speed of the wave is. And those, pre those manipulation, I don't think, you know, it's like kinase that specifically regulates CDK1, so they should not have any, and they certainly they have no effect on the nuclear, nu inter-nuclear distance, and I'll show you that. And still the speed of the wave changes, so I, but I need a bit of time before it goes. No, really. So it tends to start at the pole. It doesn't always start at the same pole at the same time, but we haven't really seen a, a bias starting at the anterior before the posterior, no. Okay, so what one does when one doesn't know anything in physics or... or yeah. Right. So the, uh, you, can, you can probably see waves in a lot of phenomena, and I'm going to argue that the master clock is the cell cycle and all the rest follows. And I'll, let's see if I don't convince you, OK? Yes? You, you will occasionally see that, but you can also convince yourself that curvature, you can, you can ignore curvature in this case, almost. 
just the curvature effect don't last long, essentially. They're, they're on a very small scale. Yeah, the you, you see some that move oh, you ne you'll never see. I mean, if anything, it will go in every direction, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, it's activity moving. Nobody's moving here. There's no flow. This is just activity. It's like one molecule activating the next molecule, activating the next molecule. I, I, yeah, well, the, most of the nuclei and the cytoplasm is on the surface and the yolk is inside. CDK1 is in the cytoplasm and nuclei mainly. Uh, there may be some in the yolk, I'm not sure, actually. But we have, we have, it's very hard to go inside because those are 40 micron tall cells, and with confocal microscopy, we don't have resolution. And there's nothing interesting happening in the yolk, we think, from the cells. Or not as interesting. OK. So what well, one does in physics, when, when you don't know anything, you do dimensional analysis. And it's like, OK, how do you get the speed? Well, you get the speed by the square root of diffusion over some uh, reaction rate. And so maybe the reason why the waves get getting slower is because CDK1 is all of a sudden diffusing slower. And you can kill that idea very quickly because you do a FRAP experiment on CDK1 and it diffuses at the same rate as cycle 10, 11, 12, and 13. So what a FRAP experiment is, is an experiment in which, uh, because I'm not sure that everybody knows, but imagine you have your embryo and then uh, you have the GFP molecule, uh, in this case was a YFP molecule, and you remember from Thomas' lecture and other lecture, people explaining you what that is, hopefully. So the, the, the YFP will be everywhere. But then what you do is that you go into, let's say, a box, and you just kill all the GFP with your laser. And then what is going to happen over time is the GFP molecule from here are going to be diffusing in. And from looking, so if you were to plot the intensity in this area, you will start high, and then you go in with your laser, you destroy all the fluorescence, your fluorescence will drop. But then molecule diffuse in, and so this will go back up, right? So from, uh, from feeding these curves with the appropriate curve from theory of diffusion, you can essentially estimate a diffusion coefficient. Or you can just look at the curves. And if you just look at the curves, I don't think you have to work hard to convince you that the, the diffusion is not changing. So something is changing about the chemistry or about the reaction in the CDK1 system. What could it be? So because we can measure activity, we can try to ask that, to answer that question. So we go back and we look at our plots of activity. And the first thing you might guess, so maybe the activity at which is CDK1 is going up around mitosis is changing. But that, again, you can very easily convince yourself that that's not the case, because these slopes really don't change. However, if you focus on, let's say, cycle 13 that is getting significantly slower, now what you see is that the activity is not monophasic anymore. You do sort of get this biphasic behavior. But, and the, interestingly, you all remember from the other lecture that the cell cycle in the early embryo is made of two phase. There is DNA replication and there is mitosis. So during DNA replication, CDK1 activity goes up slowly, and then it goes up fast in mitosis. So we reason maybe this, this slowdown that is causing the slowdown of the wave. And that rate is indeed getting slower and seems to be somewhat predictive so that if we plot speed versus that activation rate, we actually do get that we can sort of predict the speed and we actually get a slope that's not that far from, uh, from a square root. And we'll get back to why the, the system can why we can predict to the waves. OK, so if now I'm correct, that is the rate in S phase that is controlling the speed of the wave, I should be able to do an experiment in which I change that rate, and, and I should change the speed of the wave. So that's exactly what Vittoria did. And remember, I already talked to you about on Monday about the fact that as you get more and more nuclei inside the embryo, they have this mechanism to prevent that you enter mitosis before you're done replicating your DNA. It's called the DNA replication checkpoint. So as, long as, as soon as there is a problem with your DNA replication machinery, it activates a signaling cascade. And what this does, this puts an halt on CDK1. It tells, so if there is damage or stress, activates this molecule called check one. And that activates a repressor, inhibits the activator and CDK1 activity 
is uh, progressing slower or activating slower. So the prediction then will be that if we mutate this, this, uh, this kinase or the major effector we want, we should lose this biphasic behavior. And this is exactly what you observe. You now don't have, this will be the cycle 13. And you see that there is no biphasic behavior. And because there is not such a biphasic behavior and slowdown of S phase, actually the cell cycle are faster. And they keep on dividing. They do two extra divisions. And the same is true for V1. So now I've lost the slow activation. The prediction should be that the wave should not slow down. And this is exactly what we saw. So this is a movie of check one, check two. You just saw first very fast wave go through. And you'll see a second one is still extremely fast. And then there will be a last one, which is again really fast. They can split the DNA, but you can still characterize the wave. See? Yes? In the face of this hypothesis, I would have expected that you would have some slowdown also at stage 12, perhaps shorter, but. Yeah, you do. I, I, I can say you see. Oh, a slowdown here? Right, so cycle 12 is 12, so normal cycle are about 10 minutes. Cycle 12 is 12 minutes, and cycle 13 is 18 to 20 minutes. So the slowdown gets significantly longer as cycle. So at cycle 12, there is a slowdown. We can measure it. We can see it two slopes, but it's very subtle. Yeah, you're right. It's much more subtle. It's just because there is enough DNA to activate the checkpoint, but the checkpoint is not that active. And I'll show you that in a set. We have also have a check one sensor. So now if I put the numbers here, you'll see that all the speed in a plot of CDK1 activity to speed, all the speed in check one, check two, and we want all are high. And all the rates are high. And inter importantly, you get the same relationship. So the data up here fall, fall on the wild type curve. So this goes back to your question. These embryos, the nuclear, nuclear distance was changing because you were still getting more nuclei. So if that was the mechanism that explained the slowdown of the wave, this wave should have gone slower. But they didn't, and they didn't because CDK1 activity did not slow down. So we think that this is a strong argument against any mechanical signal, because we can perturb the wave in a quantitative, predictable manner by just changing CDK1 signaling, which I think is a strong um, argument. We also have um, a check one sensor. and. Um, and uh, this is just a sensor that when it gets phosphorylated, uh, there's a peptide that when it's phosphorylated, it goes out of the nucleus. And when it's dephosphorylated, it goes into the nucleus. So by measuring how much of this is outside of the nucleus versus how much of it is in the nucleus, you can estimate check one activity. And this is what you see. You see that you have very low activity at cycle 11, a little higher at cycle 12, much higher activity at cycle 13. But you also see something else, which is uh, probably the most remarkable feature, is the right one minute before the, the nuclear envelope breaks, and that's why this curve stops, which is the earliest mitotic event, this activity just plummets. So check one is high, but as soon as you enter mitosis, boom, it goes down. And it goes down in a wave-like pattern, where, which, and I, I probably not, did not put the data to show you, but this wave-like pattern is exactly the same wave-like pattern that you see in mitosis. Maybe for sake of time, I can skip this. So, so what our data argue is that there is some, somehow CDK1 that drives mitosis is also communicating back and repressing check one. And so now to try to understand this a little more theoretically and to link it back to the potential, what we did was essentially write a simple uh, chemical kinetics model for this is just actually, I'll show the equation in a second, but the, the first, the, what the model is doing is just assuming that there is a given dynamics for check one, and all that is happening from one cycle to the next is that the initial condition of how much check one activity you have is different. So cycle 10, you start with little check one activity, and then cycle 11, you have a little more, a little more a cycle 12, and then a little more a cycle 13. And that makes you go from something that almost accumulates linearly to something that becomes more and more biphasic. And this model generates waves and gives you the right scaling. So, so the model works. Now let's try to understand why the model works. 
And so this is what the, the model is for the physics uh, the equation. So the first one described C check one activity, right? The inhibitor up here. And it's just what it's just saying is that this activity diffuses and is repressed, because there's a negative sign here, is repressed by by CDK1 activity. So this is just describing this repression or this feedback. And then, and then there is an equation for active CDK1, which is diffusing and it's activated by, by this positive feedback and is repressed, or is activated by CDC25 and is repressed by V1. And the, these feedbacks are all incorporated in this function R plus and R minus. And I can tell you what those are if you want later. And then we also have noise in the system, but we also need an equation for all the total amount of CDK1. So this is a, still a bit of a complicated system. We really want uh, something a bit more intuitive. But the way that this is written and the dynamics of, that we saw in which check one really seem to follow CDK1 suggests that we can just make an assumption and just solve this equation a steady state and get some estimate of what F is and plug it in here. And also one can convince itself if you put the value for diffusion and the time scale that, uh, and what the curvature effects are, that really that this C term is going to be very uniform. There is really very little reason to believe that C is diffusing much and is much dishomogeneity in the total amount of CDK1. So you can ignore this, have this C drop a function of, of x just having a function of time and put a simple linear increase, put that in there, and so you end up with a simple equation. And now we are essentially now I'm back to the same Gisborne Landau equation I wrote before. And this is what the force field look like to answer your question. So this is a cycle eleven and this is a cycle thirteen. So at cycle eleven, this is how it looks at time t equals zero. So there is a very, very small region of stability at the low state, and then there is a very quickly only a nice state, and the system very quickly actually transition from this low state to this high state. And if you think in terms of the potential, there's really very, very little energy barrier to jump over. But at cycle 13, as you increase this inhibitory activity upstream of everything, now the force field changes completely. And at the beginning, you actually only have a, a stable state of low activity. And then as time progresses, the system becomes bistable. And uh, as I showed you, when we do our experiment, and we don't think it's measurement noise, there's a lot of variability. So what we think is happening is um, there's an important feature here that I did not describe when I, we went through the math of the wave, is that this potential is not fixed with time. The reason is that you are synthesized molecule, and as you synthesize molecule, this term is a function of time, essentially. And so, so the potential is changing. So at the beginning, there is really no high stable state, but then this potential is changing with time. And at some point, if you think of this as being the amount of active CDK1, it is possible just that there is a fluctuation that brings you from here to there. At that particular point, you jump from the low state to the high state, and you initiate a wave that travels everywhere. But if you do an experiment the next day, you're not going to jump right exactly at the same point. You're going to jump a little earlier or a little later. If you jump a little earlier, you see a slightly different potential. And I told you that if you know the geometry of the potential, so the, the wave travels really fast compared to the time at which this is changing, at least in first approximation. So you could do an adiabatic approximation in which you say, whatever the potential is at the time you jump, that's what is going to control the speed of the wave. Then that explains why you have noise, because this is a noise trigger system. As soon as this, the energy barrier becomes compatible with noise, if you want, you jump. But you're not going to jump always at the same place. And actually, you can take this model and simulate it. And as you increase and increase noise, as you would expect, you will get the, way, the jump to happen earlier and earlier. And you get slower and slower speeds of the wave. So that implies that actually. Uh, once I, that the noise controls both the time of the jump and, as a consequence, the speed of the wave. And actually, because there is noise in the system, you, and you might have already noticed, our waves are not perfect. Yeah. Um, can you take away the like, practical changes? Right. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that. 
you can change the, the speed of the wave by temperature, by, and you can make everything, but you change everything, right? And you change everything proportionally. The cell cycle get a little longer, the rates get a little slower, and it looks like the wave is a little slower. It's hard to, you don't make such big changes because this all goes like, I mean, the changing on the rates are not that high, and you could push, you, and if you really, I mean, there is a limit in, you know, temperature in which you can work and still are thing, things are still healthy. So, so I don't know that is a great test. I mean, the, I guess a better one would be to do some manipulation to change noise, but uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's a noise in the activity of CDK1, which is, and what is driving it, we don't know, but there will be some noise, could be, you know, but this noise in chemical reaction and this noise in the concentration, this, there's gonna be fluctuation in the system. But we don't really know what is driving. The, what, what the source, the final source of noise is, we don't know actually. It's good, fine. Okay, so this is, a, going back to, to the potential, the, the, this is the, this is the, the simple geometric interpretation of why the wave will get slower. If you have um, low CDK1, you have a very small energy barrier to jump, so it's very easy for the system to trigger a wave, and this wave will travel very, very fast, because if you were to invert this potential, you need high friction if you did the exercise of rolling a ball down and having to stop. But as this barrier, as you get to high CDK1, now the potential is changed in such a way that you get a slower speed. So other than explaining, um, um, why the wave is getting slower. This model made, uh, actually probably the most exciting thing that came out of the model is that it made an important prediction. And the prediction is, was that if the system is really bistable, as soon as you jump from one state to the next, from the low state to the high state, then the wave will just go. So the prediction is that as soon as you finish, or as soon as you turn off check one, or as soon as you finish S phase, now you have started the wave. So at this point, the wave should just travel. So if uh, we do repeat that experiment of mechanically ligating the embryo, but we do it as soon as they've completed this phase, the, we, sh we, we should see that the wave goes right through the barrier. And, uh, and this was really a tricky experiment to do, but we thought it succeeded to my great happiness. So, th so the idea is the following, is that if you ligate in S phase, they are still talking to each other, and therefore, these two half should become decoupled. But as soon as S phase is completed, the wave is already, if you want, what the wave is doing is synchronized near the replication, and mitosis, just everybody's on his own clock. So as soon as uh, they completed S phase, now we should switch to this scenario in which everybody has been programmed, and now everybody has been told at which time they should divide, they should not care anymore. So if I put a barrier here, they sh the, you should see the wave to go right through. Let me show you what happened, and I think you will believe that that's the case. So if you like it early in cycle 13, and you see what happens, this half divides, the wave stops there, and then this other half divides, and for this nuclei to divide, they have to wait for the second wave. What happens if you ligate an embryo that has just entered mitosis? The wave will start and will go right through the embryo, right through the barrier. And we have done this many times, at least five times, and you always see the same thing. So if you look at the activity and you ligate in S phase, then you get a wave that will start at one pole, will travel and be absorbed, and then to synchronize the other half of the embryo, you need to wait for the other wave coming from the other side. So this two half can get desynchronized by a few minutes, but if you put the, the wave, the barrier, keep saying the wave, sorry. If you put the barrier, as soon as they've entered mitosis, it goes right through because the synchronization has already happened. Now everybody is just following his own clock. And, yeah. We dated at cycle 13 because this is the cycle that has the longest test phase and give us room to work with. Right, so, so I think we have probably, in some of our, like, the first ligation experiment I showed, actually, 
in the ligation experiment, we ligate way earlier. You ligate like a cycle eight. But if you, there's two ways in which you can ligate. There's a way, a way in which you put the razor blade down and leave it there for 10 minutes. And then if you remove the, the razor blade, the two half will stay fused. That's a permanent barrier. And if you put that embryo down and you look at cycle 12, you'll see that they become slightly asynchronized. The other way to, the problem with that is that as you are ligating, they are dividing. So you, don't, you cannot have this time resolution that we need. So the another possibility is to build a new apparatus in which you put the blade and stick it under the microscope right away because this is all happening on matter of minutes. So, so I think that cycle 12, I will say, is definitely a trigger wave. Cycle 10 and 11, I, I, I still think that they're, they're still so organized that I think they are a wave. But I would guess that if you put a barrier, you will not. I mean, it's, everything is going so fast that you probably won't desynchronize them so much. So, but clearly, cycle 12 and 13 really need this active mechanism. And, um, and th that is also true. If you like it early, you'll see that the delay accumulate and they really become more, they really become very significant and prominent at cycle 12 and 13. So it's a good point. That I still think there is a wave in the earlier cycle, but it's not as important as later on. If, Oh, right, so, so this was ligated probably around here, right, around six, I would say. Yes, so you would assume this is time from when the experiments start. These cell cycles are very reproducible. They always divide. If you do the experiment around 22, 23 degrees, cycle 13 is 18 minutes, plus or minus 30 seconds. So if you want, if you want to guess where the zero of, so this will be 18, and this will be also be 18. So, okay. so probably this movie was started, you are right, about six minutes. Or this embryo was ligated about six minutes before that embryo was ligated. Okay. So the zero is the beginning of the experiment, when the, the apparatus, because you, you don't, right, what, what the way that Victoria does the experiment is that she watches an embryo, and as soon as she can see, that they are about to enter mitosis, she like gets it very quickly, like 20 seconds, and then you, you image. You don't, I mean, I don't know, we probably did not record the data, we don't not plot it before they got there, but. Okay, so this is it, I'm finishing a little earlier, just the, the acknowledgement, you, probably most of you have met Victoria, she's sitting right there, she's the one that did all the experiments, and the theory was done in collaboration with uh, Massimo Vergasola at UCSD and his former postdoc, Anna Merbinger. And Massimo is the one who taught me all the math I know about a wave propagation. That's it.